All right, thank you, Doc. And uh, yeah, the prayer seminar was wonderful uh, Friday night and Saturday morning. And I thought about that analogy, Doc. I do, I, I liked how he said and encouraged us to, to go with the bounce, but I think he meant to stay in the same room at least uh, as, as we were bouncing around. I thought, I thought about this analogy because he talks about it. He said, hey, listen, if your mind is going a certain way, going in a certain direction, perhaps there's a reason why it's going there consistently. Maybe you need to go with it and, and actually take that to the Lord. Um, and, I th and I thought to myself, yeah, that could, that could end up in some really, I could just end up getting a whole lot of other stuff done that has nothing to do with my prayer. But, it, but it, when I realized, no, I'm, basically he's saying, here's this huge room. Go anywhere in the room. Bounce around this whole room, but stay, <laughs> stay in the room. Don't go to Home Depot, Doc. <laughs> stay in the room. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, page 1002 in your pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, page 1002. And we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. And today's passage really is part 2 of a two-part sermon that Greg started for us last week. So this is part two, and it'll, it'll make sense if you think of it in terms of that, a part one and part two. And we'll do a little bit of a review to get back to where uh, Greg brought us from last week. But as you're turning to Hebrews chapter four, um, let me share with you this story. When I was in college at Moody Bible Institute, I was able to land a job in the admissions department that helped me uh, just get some small income on the side of working there part-time. And as a result of my work there part-time while I was a student, as I was getting ready to graduate and looking to prepare for grad school, looking to prepare for marriage, uh, uh, the admissions department offered me a job as a, uh, a guidance counselor and recruiter for the school, which I, I gladly took. I thought it was, it was a great opportunity. I get to work with young men and women to kind of help them figure out, am I... Is ministry something that I'm interested in? Is, something that, is this something that the Lord's cut me out for? And is Moody a good fit for me? And then kind of walk them through the application process. And one of the, uh, one of the, the cool aspects of the benefits of my job at the time was that Moody would pay for me and send me all across the U.S. to go and represent the school in uh, different areas of the U.S. And, uh, and sometimes at Christian college conferences, sometimes at... Uh, high school, college fairs. Sometimes you go to a, an individual high school and uh, speak for a chapel and get to represent the school and hand out materials and talk about the school there. And, uh, and I didn't love being away from Kelly because we were just married at the time, but I did love getting to travel. On one of these trips, I was heading out to California and uh, Annette Moy, my boss, comes into my office and says, hey, there's this cool thing going on for all of the Christian counselors, the, the association that we're part of, the accrediting association we're part of, is offering discounted tickets to this conference that's happening. And on the first night, David Jeremiah is going to be speaking, and Fernando Ortega is going to be leading worship. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I want to go to that. And she says, okay, well, then on the second night, I had to write this down. On the second night, John Piper is going to be preaching, and David Crowder is going to be leading worship. I'm like, oh, this is great. These are like some of my favorite people in the world at that point. And, and bands and speakers that had made a huge impact on me. I was, I was just through the roof excited. And Annette said, I, the, Moody has already paid for it for you, but you need to confirm it uh, just sometime uh, bef between now and then. They'll send you an email, confirmation information, stuff like that. I said, okay. So um, was getting ready for the trip, got out there, uh, met at a few different schools, spoke at a few different schools, and uh, I, had a, I had arranged it so that I could speak at one school in the morning and then go to this conference in the evening, speak at another school in the next morning, go to the conference in the evening, and uh, keep my schedule nice and full. And I got to the conference, and it was a huge turnout. In fact, it was the, the conference center was, it was actually at a center. I thought it was going to be at a church. It was at this big conference center, and a bunch of the recruiters that I had been spending the week with, going from school to school or fair to fair, were there as well. Some of the guys that I had had meals with earlier in the week we're there. We all, we all got there. We were excited to get, be a part of this conference. And we walked up, and uh, we were grabbing our name tags. And I was looking for my name tag, and looking for my name tag, and looking for my name tag, and didn't see my name tag. So I went to one of the people who was helping out and said, hey, my, uh, you know, Moody paid for me to come to this, uh, I, I, but my name tag's not here. And they said, and the, the guy, typical like, California dude, is like, sorry, dude, you didn't register. You didn't confirm like you were supposed to confirm, so... Too bad, man. <laughs> and I'm like, 
okay, well then, I will pay for it out of my pocket. What will it cost to, to re-register? And I'll, I'll just, I'll pay for it right now. Doors are, doors are closed, man. The, the, the place is booked. Can't go in. And my heart just sunk in that moment. And my buddies were standing there. A couple of these guys that I've been spending the week with were like, stinks to be you. And then they just left and went into the <laughs> conference. And I'm standing there. And all, and all these people are passing me by. And I've got this swirl of emotions going through. Like, I, on one hand, I'm, I'm like, I'm angry that I can't, like, they can't bend around. Like, I already, the ticket was paid for, right? Moody paid for it for me. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, riddled with guilt. Like, I, man, there's this gift that I lost. And then I didn't have, you know, we didn't have technology back then. So I actually... I left with my tail between my legs, went to a cyber cafe, do you remember those? Looked on my email and found that they had sent me like seven emails saying, here's information, here's information. And I just assumed, I already know what I need to know, or I'll figure that out later. I thought, I saw the subject line. I I skimmed over the contents at the time and Figured I knew what I needed to know. But in every one of those emails, it said, you need to confirm your ticket. Click here to confirm. And I never did. The passage that we're about to read is this mix of the writer of Hebrews saying, we have this incredible opportunity for you, and you have to do something about it. Read this with me. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 1, going through to verse 13. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, I sw- as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes to whom of of him to whom we must give an account. This is God's word. And this is, as you can see, it's this incredible balance of this offer that's being made and a stern warning to pay attention to it and to do something about it today. So we're going to be talking about, I mean, you can see the, the key theme, it's obvious, the theme of this passage is rest. This word rest is mentioned 10 times in the first 11 verses of this chapter. And so we're going to be talking about 
rest. And we're, here's how we're going to be breaking it down. We're going to talk about it in, in these four levels that he, the author, kind of brings out. He talks about the availability of rest, the rejectability of rest, uh, and then he gets into the nature of rest and the urgency of rest. So we're going to walk through this passage in, in that way. And let's start with this. Number one, the availability of rest. The availability of rest. When he, when he talks about this, he, he, this is the main theme. He doesn't talk about it in one specific section. It's all over the entire section. This is the point. Rest is available. This incredible rest that he's offering, that God is offering, the rest that he offered to his people in the promised land that was kind of hinting at something even greater that we're going to get at, that rest is still available, and it's available to you today. He says this in verse 1. He says, Therefore, while the promised, promise of entering his rest still stands. This, this is a standing promise. This is an open invitation. It's, the door is open right here, right now. This promise is available to you. And then he gets into it a little bit more in verse 6, where he says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And then in verse 7, he says, Today, through David, so long after it, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. In other words, the rest that they eventually did get into, so Mo it didn't work with Moses, the next generation, Joshua, they did get into the promised land. But even still, hundreds of years later, David is saying, Today, if you hear his voice, he's quoting from the temptation that happened in Massa and Meribah. And he's saying, he's bringing it forward and he's saying, still, this, that promise that was available then is still available now, today, if you hear his voice. Do something about it. And so he's saying this is available. This, this rest is available. Living in light of God's rest makes a tremendous difference in our lives. And so, and I can, I can imagine, some of you would say, well, what really, especially if you're a skeptic and you're here this morning, you're visiting, or maybe you're, You've been coming to Hilltown for a long time, and you're, you've got your arms crossed emotionally and mentally, and you're like, I don't, I don't know. I'm still not sure that I get it. What difference does it make? Think of it like this. There was a movie that came out uh, called Chariots of Fire back in the, maybe in the 70s, 80s when that was released. Um, and it was a story about a man named Harold Abramson, and another man named Eric Little. Eric Little really is the, uh, the main character in this story. Both of them were real men. They were real historical figures. Both of them were Olympic runners. I'm sure the movie, the film, probably uh, fictionalized some of the dialogue and, and character of, the, of these men. But, but, when I, but watching the film is a kind of a fascinating study on the idea of rest. And here's why. The two men are both running. The two men are working their tails off the entire time, this entire film. You see them striving and striving and striving, which is one of the key words that we see in this passage. And one of the key ideas in the book of Hebrews is this finish line faith. I want you to run with perseverance, chapter 12 says. So you see this striving. Anyway, so these men, these two men, practicing, training, getting better, striving for this Olympic trial. And the trial runs first. And here's basically, this is the difference between the two of them. Both had a passion to run, but they ran kind of, they were running on very, very different engines they were operating on. The first, Harold Abramson said something like, I am running the 100 meter dash. And when and every time I do, and when that gun goes off, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. And I need to make it count. I need to know why I exist. On the other hand, Eric Little, who was a believer, he was a Christ follower, said something like this. He said, God made me, and he made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure on me. I feel his smile upon me. And I run because he made me for this. And I run because he loves me and delights in me. And I'm going to run. He didn't notice, he doesn't, he doesn't say, I run to earn his pleasure. 
He already has God's good pleasure. He says, I run because of God's love for me. I run because of who I am in him. One of these men was striving and striving and striving in order to finally find some sense of rest. The other one was striving and striving out of joy because he had already found that rich rest. All right, one man was running out of manic insecurity. And the other was running out of total security, running in joy for his Savior and for his love. Both were working incredibly hard. One was weary, weary while he was trying to rest. The other was resting even while he was working. That's, that's kind of the difference that it makes even now for the Christian. It changes everything. It changes the way we, we view the world. It changes the way we interact with work. It changes the way we deal with the stressors of even common relationships that we have every day, day in and day out. It, deal, it changes the way we, we view our time and how we spend our time. It changes that internal engine that ends up fueling us and driving us down different tracks, different paths. It changes everything. And that's why it's one of the reasons why this theme is such a great theme throughout all of Scripture. We see it in the opening chapters of Genesis, where we see God resting from his work. We see it in the closing chapters of, of Revelation 21, where, where Jesus says, Come, I will, uh, I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to wipe away all your tears. The work is going to be done. The toil is going to be done. The pain is going to be over. I'm making everything new for you. Come and rest. You're finally going to be, I will be your God. You will be my people. This is going to be consummated here once for all. And, what, and we see these themes throughout Scripture, like the shalom peace of God. We see the justice of God. We see the, the, the love of, of God. We see the community and relationships. And all of those are hinting at this kind of rest that is woven all throughout Scripture. And so you say, okay, well, I want that. Like, I want that now, right? Even, as, even some of us as, as Christians, as Christ followers, we don't actually live in that. We, we may know it. We may recognize it. But we're not actually, we're not walking as those who are in this rest and, 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 and actually understand what it means to live in this rest. So how do we get it? What do, we, what do I need to do? How do I get there? Right? Well, the bad news is you have to come to grips with, and you have to kind of push through the, the, the bad news of it. And that's this. It's the rejectability of rest. This is point number two, the rejectability of rest. And we see this very clearly in verses one and two where he says, let us fear. In verse 1, read this. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. You know, I thought fear didn't have anything to do with the Christian life, right? Doesn't perfect love drive out fear? Well, this isn't, this isn't a fleshly fear. This isn't a, an ungodly fear. This is a very appropriate, reverent, awe-filled fear. And notice he's, his pastoral heart is kicking in here. He's saying, let all of us fear, lest any of us fail. Right? This is a community effort. This is on all of us here. So even whether, if you've experienced the rest of God or not, all of us are in this verse in Scripture. So he says, Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Verse 2, For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So remember, go back to the wilderness. Go back to the book of Exodus, and especially the book of Numbers, where it comes to a head in Numbers chapter 14, where in Numbers 14, Moses, the shepherd of God's people, the leader of God's people, there, if, if you think about it, think, about, think of the Jordan River right down the aisle here, right? And, so, and, and they're on the other side. They're on the, the side outside in the wilderness. They, they, they're coming around moving toward and on the precipice of the promised land to the east, right? And so they send spies into the land. And what, what Greg talked about last week was everything that was happening on this side of the river. This, you know, pay attention. Don't drift. Don't, like, don't be given to disobedience. Make sure that you're understanding this properly. He's talking about what was happening still in the wilderness what we're talking about this morning is looking into the promised land, peering into 
the place of rest that was promised to God's people. And so here they were. uh, Moses sent 12 spies, one from each tribe, into the land of Israel. They were there for 40 days. They went all around, up, you know, north of the country. They named some of the cities north of the country to the south end of the country. They gathered fruit. They actually had a cluster of grapes so big they couldn't carry it. They needed a stalk that went between two men on their shoulders to carry this huge cluster of grapes back over the Jordan River to, uh, to where the Israelites were encamped. And those 12 men come back with the same report saying, the land is awesome. The fruit is awesome. They said it was flowing with milk and honey. In other words, like it even had luxuries, the stuff that we wouldn't even come close to where we were, certainly not where we were in Egypt in bondage and slavery, Definitely not where we're at in the wilderness, wandering and weary. This place is amazing. But 10 of them gave bad news and said, the people are too many and too big, and there is no way we're going to be able to conquer these people. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, gave good news and said, yeah, but God can, and he will if we follow him in obedience. And Israel, hearing these 12, tasting, literally tasting the fruit of the promised land, peering into the goodness of that land through the valley right there. I I mean, I I can picture Jericho and the Jordan River and the Jordan River Valley and this lush green valley that it still is today. This fertile valley there. Peering into that land and saying, you know what? We don't think God is capable. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, like this, and and this is where it gets really personal for some of us here in this room. The writer of Hebrews is saying, I'm, I'm writing to you, a church, knowing that and assuming that there are some people in this church, back back then in first century. Italy, there are some people in every church that don't actually know Jesus Christ. You may, you may know about him. You may go to Bible studies. You maybe have been attending church and worship for years. You might even be serving somewhere in the church. But I'm going to assume, and it's safe to assume, And this is where it gets personal for some of us in this room today. Some of you here today, that you need to hear this. You don't yet know the rest that God is offering. Some of us know, you know a whole bunch of scripture, you could quote scripture, but you've never really experienced that shalom, peace, and rest that God offers. And and your lives are riddled with anxiety and you're you're taken by and you struggle with and you lose the battle to materialism or to greed or to lust and you're and you're driven and you keep trying and trying on your own you're you're like you're you keep convincing yourself that you can do a better job tomorrow and you're going to do a better job next week and you come away from church grabbing these little snippets of like proverbial truths that are going to make your life better but you've you've never actually placed your trust in god it's kind of like, like, like I imagine, can I have your purse? It's, it's like, I would, I would imagine it's like somebody saying, yeah, where am I going with this, right? Like, I know this thing exists. I know this stool exists. And I want to give, you know what, I want to, I want to give God, I want to entrust him with my, my finances I'm going to, like, I, I can give him that. I'm going to, you know, I, I, like, I know I need a new car. My car is breaking down, um, which is true. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to put, this is my mini key. I'm going to put this, I'm going to give that to God. Like, I know he can handle these things, right? I, he can handle my relationships with other people. He can handle these, these dynamics. He can, he can handle all this. But the thing that's not on the stool, the thing that's not trusting God is what? It's me, right? And so that's how a lot of us treat the Lord. We want to put all of this stuff on him and say, you take care of this. Instead of, instead of saying, you, like, you take care of me. I'm, I'm on you now. Like, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put everything I've got 
on you. I'm all in. And that's, this is what some of us are really struggling with even today. And this is what the, the warning that comes out through this passage is, wake up. If this is you, you have an opportunity of rest being offered to you here, now, today. But you keep thinking, I'll take care of it some other time. For now, just take this. God, just take, you, I know you're there. You can take care of me. You can take care of this part of me. But you're not, you're not placing your trust in him, just like Israel didn't place their full trust in him. The scary part is, if you go to the end of Numbers chapter 14, what happens is, Israel disbelieves, right, that because of their unbelief, because of their lack of unity with those who had faith. God says, fine, you, my children, are going to die in the wilderness. So he sends them away. And as soon as he does, they say, you know what, whoa, 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 whoa. We take it back. We can make this right. Hey, everybody, get your swords. Let's go and do this. And they do. They, and Moses says, don't. This is a fool's errand. You're going to get crushed because God's not with you. I'm not going with you. The ark's not going with you. But they do. They take their swords, belligerently head into Canaan, and get beaten like crazy. And come back defeated and wounded. And they go limping back into the wilderness. Their opportunity had come to a close. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, there is a reality here that you need to realize. This offer is available. It won't be available forever. So listen and wake up and take advantage of this. Now, what does he say? How, why did they miss it? In verse 2, it says, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Their doom was their lack of trust, as we just talked about. Their doom was their unbelief. So often, when we meet someone, I want you, I want you to understand this, because so often when we meet somebody who, who has been a part of the Christian community for uh, some time, or has, has come to church, or has had opportunities to hear the gospel, some, so often when we meet somebody like that who does not believe in Jesus Christ, who hasn't entrusted their life to Christ, we will tend to make the assumption that there is something lacking, something missing. We'll say, well, maybe, you know, or maybe they haven't had an opportunity. And we, we'll, we will, in our minds, we'll, we'll kind of justify it or think about it in different terms, and we'll say they must not have had a clear chance to consider the, the claims of Christianity or uh, they, maybe they haven't had a, an intelligent explanation of the gospel just yet. And we assume that there's something missing. But what this is pushing us to realize, what the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews is showing us here in this passage, is that there's something more to it than that, and that it's this posture of unbelief. It's not what's missing. It's actually what's present. And some of you in this room, I would say, you need to pay attention to this, this posture of I don't, and I won't believe this. And you need to convince me. When the message has been made clear and the invitation has been made open, and, and it led Israel to their doom and to their death in the wilderness. And friend, if that's you, Hebrews is pleading with you. Jesus is pleading with you. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. So he talks about the availability of rest. He talks about the rejectability of rest. And next, he gets into the nature of this rest. Look in verses 3 and 4. He says, For we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So there's, there's kind of two, two definitions of rest that he's getting at in this passage. And, and actually, if you think about it, in the world, just even in our world today, we generally have two uh, types of definitions of rest or the idea of rest in our 
world today, just logically, when we think about rest. On one hand, we think of rest as something, we, we think of it meaning to, to cease from motion, to cease from activity, to cease from, um, uh, and, and actually like to come and to lie in a place. Think of a boulder that's tumbling down the mountain, and then finally it starts to slow down, and it, and it finally stops at this place, and it comes to a place of what? Rest, right? And that's, so we say like that's, the, the, the boulder came to rest there, right? And that's a, that's a common definition, in our mind. The sec- so that's one. That's, it's like this, this motion commotion. The second is this idea of stopping from striving, stopping from labor, to cease from exertion, to stop from working, even, even uh, if it's mentally or emotionally or otherwise, to actually stop from effort. So it shouldn't surprise us that our ideas of rest in the world today actually are very biblically rooted. Uh, he talks about two rests here. He talks about this Canaan rest, and then he talks about this Sabbath Rest, and I, and I want to bro- break it down like this. Each of us, each of these aspects of rest, help us understand the rest that God is actually offering us every day, and especially right here in this passage. So let's talk about the Canaan rest. This Canaan rest, which we've already seen, right? We talked about uh, the the promised land that was made available to them. It's a rest of place. The Canaan rest is like that first definition of a boulder coming to rest. It's a this is a rest of place. There's no more wandering. For Israel, it was home. It was their home. They had been slaves. They had been working for somebody else. They had been building somebody else's property, building somebody else's kingdom, helping somebody else uh, bear fruit and be fruitful, right? And so finally, they had this offer of a place to be home and to make their own and to build and to cultivate. It was the end of wandering for Israel. This Canaan rest was the end of wandering. But then the second rest he talks about is this Sabbath rest, which is the end of working. It's the rest of satisfaction. It's the rest from producing. It's a rest from striving. Where do we get that? If you, if, I mean, what he talks about here is, and he alludes to this passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, where it says, in Genesis chapter 2, 1, we just finished seeing the creation account. In Genesis 2.1, it says, And God made the heavens and the earth. He finished it, and the hosts also. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his labor, from all his works. And so why does he speak of the seventh day like that? It's because, I mean, you, and you realize, it's not because God was tired, right? It's not because God was utterly exhausted and spent that he had to like, catch his breath and that he had to regain his energy. No, it was because God was satisfied. It was finished. The work was done, and it was good. God never has to stop because of energy. He chooses to stop because of satisfaction. And so this rest, this Sabbath rest, and even when we celebrate the Sabbath by, by taking a day off every week, which you should be doing, just take a day off. Choose a day. Take, take a block of time off. Rest from your work. When you do that, it proves that like, you, you join in this divine rest of God, saying that I'm not a part, I'm not a cog in the machine. I'm not a part of this. I'm not a slave to this system. I'm not a slave to materialism. I'm not a slave to success. I can stop and be satisfied with what I have and what God has given me. So, the rest that God is offering us is first, it's, it's fixed in place, and then second, it's totally satisfying. It's this, this no more wandering, no more seeking, no more shifting around, no more wilderness. We're fixed in a firm and rooted salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's born from satisfaction, satisfaction in God, ultimately. So, number four, this leads us to number four, the urgency of rest, the urgency of rest. And we see this in verses 11 through 13. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints, and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions 
of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of whom to whom of him to whom we must give an account. So in other words, he's saying strive to rest, right? Get about this. Be serious about this and strive to enter into this rest. He's saying, you, do, is he saying do you work for your salvation? No, he's not saying that we work for it. He's saying that you have to be serious about your salvation. And you have to do it now. Philip Edgecombe Hughes, a, a, an old commentator, says there's no attitude more dangerous for the church than that of unconcern and complacency. And this is why he keeps saying all throughout this passage, today, 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 if you know this is you, stop putting it off. Stop assuming that you've done what you need. Stop thinking like, I've got more time. I've, I've got till tomorrow. I will take care of this later. Stop snoozing your emails like I did, right? Stop ignoring the message that's calling out to you to do something about this today. I found this article, this news article from an event that happened back in 2007. And the title of the headline was Negligence Blamed for Russia, Head, uh, for Russia Fire. I can't pronounce the town that this happened in. Um, but it says it was, a fi- it was a firefighter's nightmare. The call for help came in the middle of the night and the burning nursing home was 32 miles away. When the fire crews arrived, an hour later, there was little they could do other than douse the flames. I'll just summarize the article here. It says, authorities blamed safety violations, toxic materials, negligence, and the distance for the deaths of 62 frail and elderly residents who perished when the fire engulfed this nursing home in southern Russia. Now here's, this is the worst part. Get this. Emergency officials said a fire alarm system signaled three times. But a watchman ignored the first two alarms and reported the fire only when he saw the flames and felt the heat. Nursing home personnel were away from their posts when the fire broke out, which slowed efforts to find keys and open emergency exits. And then it goes on to talk about some of the other damage that was done and the others that were wounded. But what, what, what crushes you about that is the man had a chance to respond. Right? The alarms were going off. They were sounding. And he was just snoozing. He was ignoring it. He was thinking, I've got, I don't know what that is. I'm sure it's not serious. Somebody else will take care of it. Or I've got time. All the warnings were there. What was missing was a sense of urgency to do something about it. And friends, Hebrews warns us over and over again, and it's going to continue to warn us throughout the book as we study through this. Stop putting this off. Some of you have been putting this off and fully trusting yourselves to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let me talk about the enemies of rest, and I'll close with this. Because there there are two enemies of rest that are addressed in this passage, and there are two commands, just as Greg explained last week, these, these two imperatives, like saying that it is imperative that you do this, right? Like these two imperative verbs, these two commands that we see in this passage that come out and come out pretty clearly. And, and it's because he's trying to address these two enemies, these two very common enemies of rest. And you and I could probably think of these enemies of rest even without looking to Scripture. But the one that he addresses is pride, and the second that he addresses is passivity. So, and, and if I were you, I would jot, these, jot them down in your bulletin. You've got space for them in the notes. But the one that he addresses is pride. The second that he addresses is passivity. And look how he gets about it, right? So, because pride... The first enemy, pride, says you can handle your problems on your own, right? You've got this. You don't need God. You don't need somebody else. You don't need to trust. You can can do this. And when, when pride shows up, it convinces us that we actually don't need God's help. We can do this on our own. We don't need his rest. 
We just, just a little bit more effort. We can muscle our way through life. We can make our relationships work. We can make things, we can solve the problems at work. We can make things go away. We've got this. I've got this. I can do this on my own. We may even have a twisted theology about that and say, God has given me the ability to take care of this on my own. So we may even pull some of that on ourselves and blame God for it sometimes. But that's a, there's, a, there's a matter of pride here. And what, what happens? He addresses it in, verse, in, in the very beginning. In verse 1, he says, Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Why, so what is he doing? What is he talking about when he talks about fear? Remember what he said. This is not... This is not a carnal, fleshly fear. This is a, a, very, a very good, healthy, awe-filled reverence and fear. This is the appropriate kind of fear for the Christian. Let us fear that any of you should fail to reach it. Why, what does fear do? Fear, in this sense, it, it's going to humble us, right? And he's, he's calling us to a, a level of humility. Why? Because pride can never look up to something else, right? Pride always looks down upon a thing. And he's saying, your perspective is totally skewed. You should be looking, you should be in awe and looking up to the one who's offering this rest, to the one who has the authority to take it away from you and to cast your soul to hell. And Jesus said, that's who you should fear. Don't fear those who can affect the body. Fear him who affects the soul for eternity. So he dresses it here with fear. Then he also gets into it at the end of the chapter. He talks about God's word. And we, we take this passage, for the word of God is living and active. We take this passage, and we'll rip it out of context very often to talk about the preciousness of God's word. And it's, and it's true, and it's here that, that God's word is powerful, and it is discerning. And it is, like, it is, it is wise, and it is in, uh, enlightening. However, the, in the context, what he's saying is, it's the word of God that will utterly humble you if you let it do its work. And how does he say that? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll cut you right open. It'll pier- piercing to the division of soul and spirit. It'll ascertain your very thoughts. It'll get right down into the motives of your heart into the, the, the joy of your soul. It'll find out what makes you tick, right? And he says, And no creature, verse 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He's saying this is the power of God's word. The very thing that Israel heard and rejected in the wilderness, God's word is the very thing that will lay you bare in judgment. And he said, so, so don't, don't take this position of pride. Because whether it's while you're, while you're still living and, the, and God's word goes to work at you, or while you're dead and God's word has to do an autopsy on your soul, it's going to happen. Why not let it happen now under the loving, surgical hand of a God who wants to see your best? And that's, that's why he's, he's urging us to address this enemy of pride. And then the second enemy of pride, the second enemy of rest is passivity, which we've seen all throughout the book of Hebrews so far. Passivity. And then when passivity says, you know what? He'll bend around me. I, I've got time. I can take care of this later. Right? I don't have to worry about this right now. And how does he address that? He says, verse 11, let us therefore strive. To enter that rest. Kick your tail into action. Do everything you possibly need to do to to, to strive to enter this rest. These are the enemies of the rest. and, and, And these are the things that tend to trip us up and tend to keep us back from entering, from crossing that Jordan River, trusting God to take care of us and entering into his holy rest. So we see here the availability, the availability of rest, the rejectability of rest, the nature of this rest, and the urgency of this rest. Will you pray with me? Father, you tell us in your word to be still 
and know that I am God. To be still, to stop striving, to stop working, to stop worrying, and to know that I am God. That nothing changes when we stop because we're just us. But you, you are the creator and the sustainer of all life. And while your work of creation is complete, and while your work of redemption is finished, you are yet at work in the world, drawing us into your loving arms. Jesus, give us enough grace to see the things that pull our eyes off of you. Give us the strength to strive diligently for this rest. And Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Convict us and guide us. And don't let the hearts of anyone here even try to find their rest in anything but you. Let us be still and know that you are God. We pray this in the name of the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. Amen.